Welcome to the Crypto Policy Symposium and our panel on predatory inclusion. One of the most powerful arguments used in favor of cryptocurrencies is that they are a way of tackling the problem of financial exclusion, banking the, ba banking the, the unbanked, cutting the cost of remittances and helping discriminated groups grow their wealth. However, other voices are questioning this narrative. There are claims that the crypto industry is actually a form of predatory finance, targeting the poor, victims of discrimination, and whole nations in the developing world. Our panel today will drill into this issue and try to get to the truth. Joining us today are Fred Abrahams, author of Modern Albania from Dictatorship uh, to Democracy in Europe, and an expert on the Albanian pyramid schemes of the 1990s. Hi, Fred. Hello. Uh, tonight, Sin Kamana of the Brookings Institute. Uh, Mario Gomez, who is a software engineer and a Salvadorian Bitcoin law critic, who was actually arrested for protesting against the adoption of Bitcoin as a legal tender in El Salvador. And Nadine Chabrier, Senior Litigation and Policy Counsel at the Center for Responsible Lending. There have been many historic examples of predatory finance, Ponzi schemes, multi-level marketing, and pyramid schemes. One of the most famous occurred in Albania in the 1990s. Fred, you experienced the Albanian pyramid schemes at first hand. Could you please tell us a little about them, including what was their impact and what actually made them so attractive to ordinary Albanians? Sure, I'd be happy to, and uh, thank you for uh, including me uh, on this panel, and I, I look forward to hearing from the experts, um, of which I am not one. I uh, just want to be clear, I, I don't have expertise in, in cryptocurrencies, but I can explain something about the 1997 Albanian pyramid schemes, and perhaps there are some lessons to draw uh, from that calamity. Um, and as you said, Martin, I mean, these were uh, massive schemes uh, that tumbled in uh, 1997. It's still unclear the total amount, uh, just so we know what we're talking about, somewhere between one and $2 billion, which you know, in, in the global markets may not, and uh, does not sound like much, uh, but in the Albanian context, uh, it nearly equaled the country's full GDP at that time. So this is something that impacted every single family member and had, as, as I'll, I'll explain, uh, truly uh, terrible consequences for the country and the region. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think um, there was um, tolerating these screams, you know, came at a very, very heavy cost. And I'll, I'll explain uh, what, what happened. There were, I think, three things that are important uh, to know. The first is how these schemes were, were created. Uh, second is how they grew at such a speed. And third is, is how and why uh, they, they crashed. So um, the, the first point is how they were created. And really, these came about as a result of economic conditions at the time, right? Albania was transitioning from one of the most closed and controlled economies and, and, and political scenes uh, in Eastern Europe, truly Stalinist and a real a command and very centralized economy. And uh, key to that in the 90s was the lack of a functioning uh, banking sector. So there was virtually no place for people to put their savings and no place for people to get loans, small, medium, or, or large businesses. So as a result, this um, you know, informal uh, banking arrangements emerged. And they started very often from um, currency exchanges, which then started to take people's deposits, started to give out loans. And um, this you know, worked in about 1995, people were receiving about 4% on uh, returns. Um, and, you know, in many ways, it was a, it was a response and a, a very, you know, capitalist reaction. There was a market need uh, and uh, entrepreneurial individuals filled that filled that space. Uh, the second is the rapid and unsustainable growth. And I think there were there were basically there were four primary reasons why the schemes in Albania flourished so quickly and so uh, intensively. You know, the first is exactly what I said already. It was the market need, which meant that other entrepreneurs stepped in and eventually there was competition, right? So while there were a few of these um, operating in the, uh, in the beginning, by 1997, there were 17 known larger companies and probably more that we don't know about. So this, of course, drove rates up just uh, due to the competition. 
Um, the second is what I would call the weak rule of law, right? Um, so there was a glaring lack of laws regulating the banking sector, let alone these sort of nebulous arrangements, uh, the lack of regulations and a lack of enforcement. So even when laws existed, they were not being enforced. So for example, all of these firms, they called themselves companies. Um, they were you know, officially legally, they were illegal, right? They were illegal, they violated the law um, because they didn't have banking licenses, but there was no, uh, you know, no attempt to, um, to, to shut them down. The third, which is very perhaps unique and maybe different from what you all will discuss after me, is um, these schemes, they grew fast and they, they were sustained and sustainable because of the influx of, of, uh, of illegal funds. So, so some of these schemes were pure, they were pure pyramid or Ponzi schemes, but so, many of them had businesses. Some of them legal, but many of them also illegal. So you know, Albania had become a hub for smuggling due to its geographic location. And there was a steady influx of, uh, of money, I think also from money laundering that, um, that resulted uh, in, that kept them alive, right? So it wasn't just because there was a limited amount of, um, of Albanian savings that could, that could flow into these firms. So um, this kept them afloat for quite some time. And the fourth and perhaps the most important was the lack of political will. So the Albanian government at the time did not want to shut these, these schemes down because they were you know, essential for the economy, for the survival of many Albanian families. Uh, without getting into detail about Albanian politics, they had just lost the elections in 1996 so, uh, and did not want to take any steps feeling uh, insecure in their power uh, before local elections the following year. But it also extends to the international community. And this is an important point um, because Albania was the darling of the West, this success story after the ravages of communism. And um, Western governments, the US, European governments had, a, a, had an outsized influence in Albania, but none of them spoke. Uh, they did not speak up. In fact, they praised Alb Albania as being this um, uh, economic miracle and did not uh, warn the government until far too late. And that includes the international financial institutions, World Bank, IMF, who did not speak up about these schemes and the dangers they posed uh, until, really until it was, it was too late. But, but, so, it was, but, but, but was, it, it, was it actually clearly obvious to, the, to, these, um, to these quite prestigious international organizations that these actually were pyramid schemes? Indeed, it was. In fact, it was quite clear to everyone because the rates of return were simply unrealistic. And so uh, they did know. And my research shows now looking back at cables and interviews with officials from that time that they did know. But in the interest of uh, a stable government and the stable region fitting in with the politics of that time, uh, they did they did not speak up. So, um, you know, and I just want to say one quick important point that um, at the time there was a common criticism uh, that Albanians were simply naive, right? You know, these people had emerged from communism. They don't know what capitalism about. They're throwing their money around and they've invested in these schemes without understanding what they are. And I think that is absolutely wrong. Um, the Albanians, in fact, they knew very well that these were largely scams, but they invested their money because they thought the government was backing it. And mm -hmm. they thought the international community was backing the government. And in fact, you know, the government, the, the, the schemes advertised on the state television, senior officials went to uh, these lavish events that they held. Um, the, the, even the, the president uh, at the time called the Albanians' money the cleanest in the world. So Albanians <laughs> felt rightfully uh, that you know, their money was safe. Uh, there was a kind of insurance. And um, they knew, I think they knew it was tenuous, but they believed in the system. And of course, you know, we know from Bernie Madoff scandals and others, you know, it does not take a naive populace or naive investors, you know, some of the most sophisticated investors in New York City or elsewhere can fall prey uh, to, these, to these schemes. So then uh, quickly then to the crash. Um, the key uh, to the crash of the pyramid schemes in Albania happened in December, 1995. And it happened in Dayton, Ohio. Now, th that might seem strange, but Dayton, Ohio, uh, for the Balkan experts among you, uh, was the site of the Dayton Accords, which ended the war in Bosnia. And uh, with those accords, um, when the war came to an end, the sanctions on Yugoslavia were lifted. 
And I mentioned before the illicit uh, inputs into the schemes, um, and that was primarily from oil smuggling. So Albania was, was a conduit for the smuggling of oil in violation of the sanctions into Serbia and Montenegro. And when the sanctions were lifted, that business dried up and it had a direct impact. The interest rates of the schemes almost immediately began to rise because they were not receiving that extra input from, from illicit sources. So um, uh, it was only a matter of time. Uh, the schemes you know, began to compete and raising their rates, they reached up to 40%, which are obviously untenable. And eventually they collapsed, um, you know, causing uh, with deadly consequences, right? About 2000 people died in Albania. 2,000 died. died from, there were protests against the government, the government tried to crack down, the government tumbled, uh, um, military bases were looted, and I would just say, um, without getting too off track, in many ways it had a direct impact on the war that was to come in Kosovo, because the looted weapons ended up in the hands of the Albanian insurgency the Kosovo Liberation Army. So the regional stability that was um, the primary goal of Western politics at that time, uh, and the reason they stayed silent about these schemes ended up undermining all of that. So I'm just gonna close by just um, pulling out three, three brief conclusions that might be relevant uh, to those of you as you uh, discuss further. Um, the first is just a repetition of what I already said. I think one of the key reasons in addition to the illegal uh, um, sustenance and nourishment of these firms was the lack of regulations, right? It was the lack of laws, it was the lack of rules, it was the lack of transparency, it was the lack of accountability. And maybe there's some relevance uh, for um, the situation with, with uh, crypto uh, today. Um, the second is these firms, uh, these companies, um, they did target the vulnerable. Now, you, one might argue that, you know, all Albanians were vulnerable, you know, poverty, uh, was very you know, prominent and widespread in Albania. But you know, there was one scheme I remember, they offered special rates for pensioners uh, and the poor. One of them was called the Charitable Foundation. Um, you know, so there was this sort of, um, yeah, this, uh, sort of praying uh, uh, um, element um, on, on people in need. And the third, and I'll end here, is um, really what I think is the key, and it was the lack of political will. You know, I mentioned the Albanian government at that time had no interest to shut down these, you know, to stop these schemes, even though they knew, what, you know, likely where it would lead. The international community had no interest, but also the society writ large. So the opposition at that time, which you would think would criticize the government, also stayed silent. One of them told me, you know, that to go against the schemes would have been to go against the entire mm -hmm. country, uh, but also the media. And I'll end here because the Albanian media, um, you know, failed to investigate uh, and explain for the public you know, what these schemes are about. In fact, they even, you know, one of the bigger schemes, they named the head of it the man of the year. Uh, the articles about these schemes were not you know, what's going on and how you're, you could lose your money, but rather how do you invest? Where do you find the next vendor uh, to, put, to put your money down? So the, the media failed. Um, and uh, you know, to, to, to provide a service to the citizens and, and you know, explain for them what risks they were taking. And so mm. I'll end there. I think that, you know, that's the spirit of this conversation is to have a critical conversation. Uh, so I'm glad to participate. Thank you. That's a terrible history lesson. Um, so I think it's, it's pretty clear that predatory finance, if allowed to get completely out of control, it's not just about individuals losing money. It can actually devastate whole countries and, and communities. So in terms of the, 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 the targeting of groups, um, the, the crypto industry, particularly in the United States, has been quite heavily targeting minorities. And earlier, earlier today, I actually looked up a quote on a website called Black Bitcoin Billionaires. So you might recognize some of the themes here. I'll just read a very short quote. There's diversity in the adoption of Bitcoin, and it's not limited to race, creed, or religion. Everyone has equal rights of access to participation, and the adoption of Bitcoin as black Bitcoin billionaires tackles marginalization and oppression in all communities. Now, Nadine, I know you've been looking at the, the, the market of crypto to, to people of color in the United States, to Nazi, and I know you've been doing a lot of specific research on uh, big cryptos lobbying of, of mayors. What, what's, what's going on in, in the US and does it resemble some of the, the themes of predatory finance described by, by Fred? 
Sure, so I'm happy to start. Um, and maybe it's helpful to even just walk walk us through some of the narratives that we hear regarding cryptocurrencies and financial inclusion, because there are actually a, a few of them. You actually brought up a few at the beginning of your remarks. And um, you know, one one narrative is the one that we hear more commonly when it comes to bolstering financial inclusion. And the idea is that you know, cryptocurrencies will fill a gap or a need for unbanked or underbanked populations. And the idea here is that um, you would essentially use cryptocurrencies the way that you would use money and that this population lacks access for making digital payments, digital transactions. Um, a second narrative that we hear is perhaps more along the lines of that wealth building narrative that when we're talking about financial inclusion, we're talking about targeting Black and Latino populations that are seeking upward mobility because cryptocurrencies, proponents say, will um, help them build wealth. And so in this use case, it wouldn't be that you're using it, um, you're not using cryptocurrencies to spend it as money for everyday goods and services, but rather you're using it as an investment. You're meant to hold on to it not spend it. Um, and I think it's important to note that even with all of these groups, um, unbanked, underbanked, Black, Latino communities in the United States, they have been historically excluded from traditional financial institutions, products, and services. And so I do believe that it's understandable that they seek alternative avenues and outlets for making transactions or building wealth. However, just because the status quo isn't working, and it isn't, does not mean that cryptocurrencies are the solution because even within these two narratives, you know, you already have uh, conflicting use cases, conflicting objectives. Do you spend it or do you hold on to it and invest it? Which one is it? And I think this kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, within these larger like um, proponents of cryptocurrencies, like their claims, their promises, it's almost as though cryptocurrencies are touted as this way to be a magical solution for everything and everyone yeah. when in reality, and you start digging through some of the, like the, the realities of the technology or the economic principles, you start to see a lot of risks and drawbacks in the space. And so, you know, from a payments perspective, we already know cryptocurrencies are notoriously volatile with dramatic price fluctuations. If you're trying to make a transaction, depending on the volume, of a network at a given day or time that might come with high fees, network fees on top of the platform fees. It might be a time consuming transaction. So it's not really even meeting the needs of unbanked populations. For example, you can't reverse transactions, which then you know leaves little room for mistakes. But then if you start thinking about it from a wealth building perspective, you know, this is cryptocurrencies are grounded in speculation. They're not based on tangible value or tangible assets and where they're deriving their value is on this idea that other people believe that it has value. But what happens when people stop believing? When say people move on to the next technology or the next shiny object, um, that, that value will plummet and you're, you might be left holding the bag. Um, but then even separate from you know, these different use cases, you start to kind of look at the operational risks of the technology itself and We've already seen numerous reports where either cryptocurrencies or the related platforms, um, you know, they've, they've been rife with uh, scams, with fraud, with hacks, with bugs. And all the while this is taking place with um, little to no consumer protections, leaving a lot of people at risk. And so, you know, the title of this panel is called, uh, you know, it's related to predatory inclusion. And we do see a direct link between cryptocurrencies and this concept of predatory inclusion. Other sociologists and researchers like Hyango Yamada Taylor, Tressie McMillan Cotton, Louise Seamster, and others have looked at this concept in other areas. But the idea is that marginalized communities um, are excluded from a product, a service, or an opportunity. Then all of a sudden they're given access to a similar or the similar product, service, or opportunity, but it's a little different because that access is also coming with conditions that compromise the benefits, conditions that might even reproduce insecurity for these very same communities. And so 
Some examples that these researchers and scholars have written about come in the form of payday loans, subprime mortgages, um, student loan debt. And it's really interesting to hear even like similar language being used because when payday loans were you know, first introduced, they were talked about as democratizing credit. Subprime loans were talked about innovations that were gonna increase access to home ownership and therefore so these, wealth building opportunities. So these stories have been used before. Yes, and, and with subprime loans, unfortunately, we saw that in, in the, it came with conditions. It came with risks that ended up being the building blocks to the 2008 financial crisis that actually ultimately decimated Black and Latino wealth in the United States. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so similarly with crypto, we hear that it's going to lead to access, access to payments, services, maybe access to wealth building, maybe, but we do know that that access is going to come with risks and it's going to come with um, conditions that will compromise the benefits. And so, you know, despite all of this, we are hearing and seeing elected officials across the world, across the United States, at all levels, just continuing to promote and tout cryptocurrencies. They romanticize cryptocurrencies. I've written about it from the perspective of mayors and local governments promoting cryptocurrencies. Yes, so um, um, it's, it's happening everywhere. I think I think one of the most interesting examples talking of plunging assets is is, the, is city coins. Right. Which ties in with uh, Fred's point about official recognition. Could you just tell us a little about city coins and what, what's become of them? Sure. We have had um, certain mayors, specifically in Miami, was probably the more prominent example, um, you know, want to get involved with this concept of city coins. They themselves did not produce the coin or hold the coin. It was a separate organization. But the idea was that if you were interested in promoting a city, supporting a city's endeavors, then you could invest in the city via a city coin. Um, but unfortunately, those city coins weren't actually um, use, uh, useful for a specific product or service within government. And so um, unfortunately, after you know, touting the specific coin, the value of that coin plummeted by like 95%. And so anyone who invested in that actually lost a tremendous amount of value. And again, I think what was unique and it was similar to what Fred was talking about is that it was actually elected officials that were promoting this. Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon us to push our elected officials, to push our regulators, to really scrutinize those idealistic narratives, to scrutinize the hype and to scrutinize the fundamental characteristics of the cryptocurrencies, the technology, the economic mm -hmm. principles, but most importantly, the risks and the drawbacks. Um, so with that, I'll actually pass it on to Nadine because I know she has a lot to talk about as well in this space. Nadine, before you start, would you mind just telling us a little bit about the, the good work your organization does? Yes, I, I'd be happy to. So thank you, Tony and I'm happy to take the baton here. So um, I work with the Center for Responsible Lending. So. We're really focused on the financial health and well being of Black, Latino, and lower income communities. And so, um, you know, we came up with some principles of responsible lending. And these principles, I think, help us imagine a world where there is financial inclusion. So, financial inclusion meaning opportunities for historically disenfranchised communities to build wealth and to be free from excessive fees and predatory products. Um, so the principles themselves are geared towards the lending context, but there's some lessons here that um, I wanna draw from. So as Tonantzin mentioned, the context here is communities of color here in the United States are denied opportunities to build wealth, denied access to sustainable credit, shut out of opportunities to build assets. And furthermore targeted with destructive products in the name of access to credit. So some of the products I'm thinking of, high cost installment loans, payday loans, overdraft fees, and now crypto. You know, these products are extracting wealth, um, fees and interest from lower income communities, and they're holding the burden um, of the risk. So, you know, things are marketed as lifelines, but they are actually, a, a path into a cycle of debt and they leave um, consumers worse off. So one of the hallmarks of predatory lending, I would say, is that corporations benefit when consumers fail. Um, and just to touch on the principles themselves, you know, we advocate for um, 
interest rates of 36%. Um, applying credit laws to all types of credit, even if it's novel. Um, assessing consumers' ability to repay debts and enforcing laws that uh, prohibit unfair and deceptive practices. So um, the ideas that I really draw from in the crypto context are identifying all financial products as such, even if they're not familiar to us, still a financial product, and then regulating the, the financial product in a standardized way. In addition, sussing out those unfair and deceptive practices. So. Um, you know, something that a lot of people are familiar with, which I also like to draw parallels to, is buy now, pay later. So, um, you know, you anyone who's online shopped has seen this. It's a pay and for model. Um, you frequently, it's on retail products like tech or beauty um, or apparel. Um, it's offered at check, uh, checkout. You know, you make your payments every two weeks and it's marketed as interest free. So here we also have novel fintech driven rapidly expanding largely unregulated product and further marketed towards lower income black and latino folks through social media through relationships with vendors that are appealing um, so here we see again like crypto lack of regulations and a mismatch of consumer expectations so you know in the buy now pay later context um, consumers, um, they experience fees or they, they incur fees um, that they weren't expecting. Um, the Black and Latino and low income consumers, the same ones who are likely to use buy now, pay later, also are the same communities that overdraft. So for example, um, a lot of folks um, take out multiple buy now, pay later purchases. They find that they um, incur late fees or yep. other fees like return payment fees, and then potentially an overdraft if they miscalculate their payments. So, you know, this particular product really feeds on impulse buying and spending more than the consumer intended. Um, and here we find a lack of uniformity and standards that really hurts consumers. So while under credit cards, we have some important protections like underwriting, assessing ability to repay, like disclosures, what are the fees associated with this product and what is the percentage rate, um, statements um, to assist in keeping track of payments and having transparency in fees, fraud protection. You know, these things are missing there. Yep. Um, um, and, you know, when, when we were preparing for this, Martin posed the question of why do we have this recurrent theme of novel product lack of yes. regulation that's, that's one of the things i was wondering because it sounds like crypto is following a very well trodden path in terms of exploiting the vulnerable it, it is and um, so we have a context in which novel products grow outside of existing frameworks purposefully so mm -hmm. industry change outpaces regulation it just keeps happening because it's purposeful and regulators are behind the curve so um, and they're existing in this wealth stripping context for, for people of color. And, you know, in the crypto context, um, people of color disproportionately lose money. Um, yes, because I, I mean, I, I read some of the statistics, the crypto industry has been actually very successful marketing, particularly to African Americans, and they've disproportionately lost out as a, res as a result of the, the, the crypto, crypto crash and the collapse of some of these crypto schemes. Right. Um, so there's a number of policy areas that are really well worth exploring within crypto. So um, particularly for me, crypto lending, um, there's really no regulation in this space, therefore no protection. So yeah. you have a situation where bank platforms are acting like banks, but there's no regulatory yeah. pr protection for, um, for the consumer. So um, security securities regulators um, internationally kind of highlighted some concerns recently. So, um, you know, when there's a failure in the system, uh, will users get their funds returned? Um, you know, there's a risk there that, um, you know, the, the currency owner might lose access to their funds suddenly and per potentially permanent, permanently. Um, there's concerns about conflict of interest 
Um, you know, investors and venture capitalists have a say on the governance and control of the currency, not the not the owners, not the traders. Um, so, you know, I have a great concern for consumers and their well-being when they borrow against a currency that gets devalued. So, um, different things can happen, but you know, they might lose their assets completely. They might have put their money in completely in this asset and completely lose it, or they may have to obtain more currency to adjust the loan to value that they've, yeah. they've borrowed. So um, they might miss payments. I mean, it's uh, it's potentially devastating if you put a huge investment into this currency. So, um, you know, another area that I uh, look at a lot is disclosures. So crypto feels really murky. It feels and yeah. is marketed sometimes as if there's some secret knowledge that you need to succeed. Yeah. Um, and so disclosures could help our consumers understand the risks associated with their investment or whether this is an investment at all. Because um, yes. I've seen know. lots of um, crypto influencers trying to push training courses about Bitcoin and the like, which don't actually seem to train people to do anything other than buy more cryptocurrency. Right, and, and I think that's problematic. So regulation, guardrails and and standards around crypto will help um, consumers in that way. And what you're also alluding to is unfair and deceptive practices. So are, are they marketing this product in a deceptive way? Is the terminology they're using to even name the product deceptive? Yeah. Um, you know, again, is the reality of the experience matching up to the expectations given to the consumer at, at the outset? So, um, you know, there. I'll, I'll touch on um, you know potential reforms briefly, and we can talk about it um, further on. But you know, there's there's a lot of room here for change. So regulation. Yes. There's room for enforcement. There's room for legislation. There's room for data collection. So. Yeah. So I think, we're going to, I think we're going to explore policy suggestions in a, in a bit more detail in, 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 the, in the group discussion. Just one final question to, to you, Internet. Crypto industry has made some very big claims about aiding financial um, inclusion. Is there, have you seen any reality at all to those claims? Any, any remedy? Any reality? Oh, reality to the claims. At the moment, no. And I think part of the excuse that at least I often hear or I read about is that, well, the technology isn't advanced yet. And so oh, yes. I think the highlight is more so the potential for the technology. Oh, yes. So not to rein it in now because it still has potential. It's like the early days of the internet. It misses the fact that this technology has been around for a number of years already, like millions and billions of dollars have been invested into the space and it, the technology itself still hasn't progressed. And so, you know, given this reality, then I do still think it's worth um, scrutinizing everything from a more critical lens, especially if you're going to promote it to the public. Um, and, and that often then involves ensuring that you do have, as Nadine was talking about, the consumer protections, because okay. that reality yep. isn't meeting up with the expectations. Okay, thank you. So Mario, you're from the beautiful country of El Salvador, which uh, has has some parallels with Albania in terms of actually having had a, had a difficult history, but it's as, 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 as a people who've been trying very hard to actually build up their country, build up democracy and in, increase the level of prosperity. So you have a president who seems to be staking the financial future of his country on, on, on Bitcoin. How, how, how is that going? And is, is that getting, getting Salvadorians interested in crypto? Yeah, I, I think I, I can start like uh, giving a little bit of context to so we can draw parallels uh, of what's going on in, in what happened in Albania. Um, we came from this bloody civil war that was mostly motivated uh, because people was fighting against the oppressive uh, military regimes, mostly right wing up op oppressive regimes uh, that ruled the country for so many decades. And, and this conflict lasted at least the, 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 um, the most bloody part of the conflict lasted for uh, almost the, the, the whole decade of the 80s. Uh, um, it 
finished it on 1992 with the uh, signature of the peace accords that established like this new democratic agreement and 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 it guaranteed some rights for the population that uh, was like the future that the population really wanted for the country. Um, obviously, the economy of the country wa was uh, stopped during the, during the war, uh, except some industries that had like the government protection by, by that time. So uh, the next decade after the uh, peace uh, accords, um, it was a time where new industries started to grow. Um, the political uh, party from the right wing uh, came into power uh, or stayed in, into power during, during that decade. And um, because essentially we went from a right wing uh, government, uh, we already have like uh, a lot of financial institutions. We already have uh, banks and regulations in place. Uh, but this didn't prevent it for, for, from uh, some Ponzi schemes happening. And one of them uh, widely known was this institution that had like two funds, uh, an insurance fund and an investment fund that essentially operated like uh, a Ponzi scheme uh, in, in 1997. Um, uh, but uh, similar to what happened in Albania, people trusted this because uh, the ones that were, were running this schema were closer to the uh, to the government, uh, to the to the ruling party. So, um, mm -hmm. and uh, when this uh, uh, schema implode because it was not sustainable, a lot of people. Uh, lose their money. Fortunately, uh, because they were regulated, at least the, the small investor were able to recover uh, some of the funds, but uh, it's calculated that uh, almost uh, $130 million were lost on this schema. And you can imagine that El Salvador was just starting to grow back their economy, and, and you find this really big Ponzi scheme that was promoted um, somehow uh, because they were closer to the government. So that's a pretty big parallel with what, with what happened in uh, so what was happening in Albania. So that's a tragic story, but it almost sounds like that's that's kind of inoculated Albania against yeah. so, El Salvador yeah. against Albania. Yeah, and, and, but you know, the thing is that um, um, in general, El Salvador has a lot of regulations and law against uh, usury, uh, and against um, and, and and we have like very strong uh, consumer protection law, Mo mostly derived because people was exposed to a lot of these schemas. To this day, we still see uh, people promoting Ponzi's and multi-level Ponzi schemes that uh, to try to people to 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 fall in this scam. So. We have a, uh, a, a consumer protection law from 2005. Um, we have a local provider um, of uh, small money transfers be between citizens that started as a private company. It's uh, Tigo Money that essentially provided a, a, a cell phone um, system to transfer a small amounts of money. Uh, they started to operate in 2011. Uh, but they were essentially operating outside of the financial system. So the government uh, had to make a final inclusion law that uh, regulated this electronic means of payment because the uh, private sector was trying to push this and, and essentially running outside any regulations. And in 2015, we even had uh, uh, this uh, final inclusion law that allow us to create uh, more accessible banking products for most of the population. So um, in El Salvador, again, we have laws, we have regulations, uh, but the problem is uh, the lack of enforcement because you know uh, all the policies that uh, we have after the peace accords essentially reduce the, the size of the government institutions. So, uh, that doesn't give them a lot of power to actually regulate what is happening. Um, and if we fast forward a little bit, um, uh, we found that this kind of schemas is still happening back there in El Salvador. In 2019, we had another company 
that uh, created uh, some kind of uh, um, platform to invest on foreign yeah. exchange, the, the classical forex company yeah. that gives you access we, to we, some kind we, of things. We, we even have those in the UK. Yeah. So, but it, it was kind of interesting the way that this company worked because they created an actual uh, technology incubator and they sell, they sold this to the people like there, there was some kind of uh, venture capitalist behind it. But in reality, it was just a Ponzi scheme and they were trying to launder the money that they collected uh, uh, from the people and trying to create this um, uh, this incubator for technology. They even uh, funded a couple of companies, uh, a couple of them still working today, but uh, later on, uh, we figured out that it, it was fake. Everything was uh, so, related so, to this company so was you, fake, essentially. So you've got a couple of decades of, of, of history of yeah. this, this, this battle yeah. between predatory finance and actually some yes. very well-intentioned laws to actually control that. And then came along the Bitcoin law. That's right. And, it, and it's kind of interesting because in 2017, the central bank issued a, a warning regarding the speculative nature of cryptocurrencies. And after, shortly after that, Nayib Bukele uh, wrote a tweet saying that the central bank uh, has to accept Bitcoin without any context, without any explanation about what uh, he was talking about until, to, uh, um, until uh, 2021, when he announced it on the Bitcoin conference in Miami that we are going to adopt the Bitcoin law. Uh, a couple of days after that, they accept, uh, they, they pass this law without any discussion on the uh, National Assembly. Uh, and um, well, it's it's interesting how they have been changing the narrative since this day zero, because uh, on the Bitcoin conference in Miami, they were talking that um, the main reason to adopt Bitcoin is to reduce the cost of remittances, which yes. doesn't make any sense, because at least for the for Central Americans, for people from El Salvador, Honduras, in Guatemala. Um, and in the particular case of the U.S., um, you know, there is many people with an irregular um, uh, migration uh, status, so they don't want to uh, become part of the traditional banking system because they think that this is going to be used against them uh, on their uh, migration uh, procedures, right? So. Um, uh, people prefer to use like this uh, remittance service that they can find outside the places they, they work. And, and they offer uh, very little uh, fees to do uh, money transfer. So when you compare all the uh, small fees that you need to pay when you have a credit or debit card, yes. when you uh, take into consideration the hassle that the people need to go through when they need to open a bank mm -hmm. account, in particular, when they don't have like a regular yes. uh, um, status, uh, then you understand that this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, uh, so, as I understand it, Salvadorians in the United States earn dollars and they send dollars to El yes. Salvador, which is yes. which is the, the legal currency. And um, the, the remittance story was: you take your dollars, you convert them into bitcoins, and then you and then you send them back. <laughs> And this yeah. is how 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 much has this taken off? This which sounds well, like nonsensical. Not, not much, yeah. really. Um, we have data from the central bank, and I think that no more than two, two percent of all remittances are sent using uh, cryptocurrencies. And this takes us next to the next change in narrative because the government wanted the population to use this official Bitcoin uh, uh, wallet that they name uh, uh, Chivo, that is the sovereign slang for cool. So uh, the reason why they wanted to push this is, uh, and the reason why they justify the use of this wallet is because they say that it will give banking access to the population because you know around only two uh, in ten people has uh, actual access to the banking system. So yeah. they say that through the Chivo wallet they will able to cover the rest of the population. And um, the funny thing is that when the prices started to drop, uh, when the when the cryptocurrency started to crash. 
uh, they change it again, the narrative. And now they are saying that people need to buy cryptocurrency because in the future, the, pri the price is going to increase again and it's a way to uh, build some kind of wealth uh, for the future. So we have been through in the, in the last year through these three different narratives to try to justify the, the use of cryptocurrency. But and, and, and at the same time, you, your, your president has been spending um, El Salvador's precious foreign exchange yeah, dollar yeah. reserves to actually buy Bitcoin, which is subsequently tumbled in value. Yeah, and, and, and it's really sad because not only because what he says buying that I, I have my doubts because there is no real evidence of, of any of these purchases, more than a couple of screenshots. But the fact that we have uh, screenshots, spend, that's only... yeah, that, that's the only thing that we have. That's the only thing that we have. Oh, wow. But for uh, the whole implementation has costed uh, almost half a million dollars of tax pay of sovereign taxpayer money that could have been expended in 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 other things and so how, things how much is that? Um, it's half a million dollars because you need to take into consideration the ATMs, the development of the platform, okay. um, the trust fund that they use to convert between Bitcoin and and, and dollars. So. Yeah, it's it's a lot of taxpayer money that is that we don't know. We don't have a way to really know what's uh, going on, and it's promoted by the government itself. And 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 I think that when we compare with the actual use cases uh, of Bitcoin, we have the um, this study that is. Uh, that is really recent from the National Bureau of Economic Research wh when they tried to explore with the help of local universities what's the real use of, of, of Bitcoin. What they found is that most of the people only downloaded the application because they wanted this welcome uh, credit that the yep. government was uh, giving at that point and they never used it again. Sure. And, and the only people that is using uh, the, the the wallet at this point are people that has a little bit of extra income, and yes. they are using it I was especially just, to speculate. Yes, just I was just going to ask to conclude: who, if anyone, has actually benefited from the Bitcoin law? Well, that's a very good question, and unfortunately, we don't have any way to really know what's going on because the government has. Uh, restricted all the information of what's happening, but you know, uh, if if you if we look at the past, uh, normally when you have a government that is trying to hide what they are uh, doing with the with the taxpayer money, usually is to benefit a group of companies or a group of individuals, and and we can see this because they insist and push this Bitcoin thing even when the data is showing that uh, not really uh, many Salvadorians are using it wow. day to day. Okay, so just, just to, to conclude in terms of, um, we've seen a few common themes reaching all the way back to the Al Albanian experience of um, uh, official, uh, official support or uh, things growing up outside the margins of reg reg regulation changing narratives around why you should in, in invest in particular schemes, whether it's historic pyramid schemes or whether it's cryptocurrencies. What do you think policy, policy makers, both at the, at the national level and also uh, within international organizations, what, 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 should they, what should they be doing? What should they be thinking about in terms of actually um, dealing with some of the very real problems and the very real risks which have been highlighted today? Well, um, personally, I think that if the promoters of cryptocurrency want to treat cryptocurrency as money, it must be regulated as the same way that money is regulated. Uh, th there is no way to treat it differently than other final financial products. And, and I think that um, once you start uh, like trading all these uh, crypto technologies and blockchain, like other financial, similar financial products, then it, it will be uh, the real test to see if these systems are offering value to yes. their proposal so, or if just buzzwords. So, <laughs> Nancy, Nadine, what's 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 your thoughts about policy? Do policymakers need to do something? 
what should, and if they if they do what what should they what should they be considering um i could start so um there there's lots of ways legislators and policymakers and um you know regulatory agencies can act so one of the ways as i mentioned is collecting data getting information on the practices and uh, you know potentially disparate in impacts of of these companies um Consumer regulators can set a benchmark at which a company can be regulated. So above X value, above X number of dollars, then you know you can um, start to put supervision and examine these companies. Um, securities regulators can act to help stamp out fraud. Um, you know, SEC here just added um, more staff to its crypto unit to kind of enforce fraudulent and unregistered crypto. Um, you know, uh, there's just so many ways, but it, it can't be that people are paralyzed. You know, um, you know, another example is in California. Um, they are looking at having crypto platforms register with their regulatory agency, thereby having examination um, requirements. So again, look at the data, um, require disclosures, um, and have a a baseline requirement that they work in the best interest of consumers. So lots of room to think about um, what to do here. Yeah, I definitely agree with Nadine. And I guess I would just say that one of the things that at least I've been thinking about is that oftentimes crypto proponents seem to be doing things in reverse when it comes to problem solving. So like rather than start with the problem or the pain point and then find yeah. a solution, we're doing it in reverse and saying, let's try to find the way that cryptocurrencies can um, solve a problem. We're trying to essentially find a use case for cryptocurrencies when there are far more direct ways, probably efficient, like more efficient ways, less expensive ways of directly addressing the problem. We never mm -hmm. needed cryptocurrencies to mm -hmm. address you know, bank accounts, um, wealth building avenues, those discriminatory yes. barriers. So, what we needed so was political will. So understand the real problems and think about how to solve them. Come along to you and say, "I've got a solution," and not even necessarily be able to explain what 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 the problem really is or what the, what what the, what what the causes exactly. are. Exactly, and we have plenty of research on how to directly address those issues. Some of them don't even require technology; they just require policy solutions. Okay, so um, just. Concluding with Fred, who started our story in Albania, um, with, without necessarily dwelling on the on the specifics of of of, of crypto, um, is is there? You you talked about the the fear and the the the, the lack of will to do anything in 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 Albania um, about the about the pyramid schemes. Um, in, is is there anything you'd actually recommend to just sort of attitude to 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 just looking at innovative forms of finance to just not to avoid that kind of paralysis which you which you saw in Albania? Um, well, you know, I mean, I think the the policy recommendations uh, made here today, you know, made a lot of sense to me. I mean, one question I'd have for Tenencin and Nadine is whether strategic litigation could play a role. You know, if there is, well, not if there is, because there is discrimination uh, against uh, certain groups, certain um, populations and groups, maybe that that's an avenue to explore. I'd be interested to hear if, if, if that's something in the mix. I mean, otherwise, you know, I just answer very broadly, which is, I think, the critical spirit of this panel. Uh, and, you know, not swallowing the pill or being blinded by the shiny light of new technologies and new financial opportunities without critical reflection and introspection yep. and review. Yep. Um, and, you know, that didn't happen in Albania. It's clearly not happening, uh, you know, in, in, at least in the, in the situations at least the United States and El Salvador that we're, we've heard about today and, and, and in other places. So, um, you know, it's with that spirit of an investigation and critical thinking yeah. Uh, I think we can, you know, help to to, to raise these issues to the surface. And, and I think that's very much the spirit we've we've been trying to actually uh, have running through through all the panels of of the symposium. So I'd just like to thank you very much. You have been a fantastic panel, an amazing combination of knowledge and integrity. And um, I, I hope people listen. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.